Hey everybody, I'm Jack Rita with Future Pastimes. I'm a designer on some of the expansions for Cosmic Encounter, and I'm an overall Cosmic Encounter super nerd. And I thought I would talk in this video about eight things that are rules that are easy to miss in the rule book or easy to misunderstand, or they aren't really covered very well in the rule book. Uh, but I thought it would be helpful for people to get a better grasp on them. So let's take a look at some of those things. We're going to start off with start turn. Now, if you look at the uh, sheets for all of the aliens, you got the phases along the bottom, and you do have start turn. But is start turn a phase? Well, the answer is yes and no. And really, it's no. It's not really a phase all its own. But there are certain things that only happen at start turn. And it's important to understand that a turn can be composed of one or two encounters. And when does the encounter start? Well, the encounter starts at the very beginning of a player's turn in the regroup. Regroup is the beginning of an encounter. So a lot of people are like, well, I thought the encounter started once we knew who the main players were, or when we're actually playing the cards. What is the start of an encounter? And it's regroup, but... The first regroup that a player has on their turn has a start turn half a phase. It's not really a phase. It's just a marker for effects that only can happen once on a player's turn. So if you have two encounters, the start turn effect is not going to happen at the beginning of the second encounter. It only happens at the start of your turn. Your turn starts with one encounter. You might only have one encounter on your turn if you don't win or make a deal. Uh, but if you do, then you typically are going to have a second encounter. And you start the second encounter, but you're not starting your turn. That already happened. So hopefully that makes some sense. A couple of examples of things that only happen at start turn. Well, if you're the offense and you don't have any encounter cards in your hand, Start turn is when you check to see that and you can get a new hand. If you finish that encounter and you're getting ready to make a second encounter and you don't have any encounter cards, well, you don't get a second encounter. Uh, there's no start turn effect there because your start your turn already started. And there are certain aliens like hate and love that have a very powerful effect uh, and, and it could only really happen once on their turn. Uh, hate would be just way too much hate if they were able to do that at the start of each encounter. So if you have an ability that only fires in regroup, well, that would be something that you would do every encounter. And for instance, the regroup phase where you're getting a ship out of the warp as the offense, you get to do that every regroup at the start of every encounter, not the start of your turn. Yes, at the start of your turn, but then if you have another encounter, you can do it again. So Maybe I haven't helped out at all in explaining this, but what I want you to understand is start turn is not really a phase. It's not supposed to be a phase. It's not supposed to be its own phase. It's just supposed to be a marker to indicate your first encounter when your turn is starting. And that's the difference. The encounter is all of the phases from regroup to resolution, uh, but that could happen twice. And so... The first time it happens is the start of your turn. So I, I hope that clears it up for you. Probably not, and that's fine. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about is destiny. And there's a couple of things about this that I want to talk about. Uh, one is you've got a couple of options that are listed here on your destiny card for if uh, you are the color that you've drawn here. So if the player who has uh, the black ships and the black system draws black, it says your first option is have an encounter with any player in your home system. So if somebody has a foreign colony in your system, you can target them and try to get uh, presumably your own colony back or just to boot them off to lower their score. Note, though, that you are giving up one of your encounters to advance your own score. So a lot of people don't necessarily do that. Um, and then option B is to discard, discard, and draw again. And that is something that Typically, players will do when they draw their own color. But there is a third option, um, and it's related to the first one, but it's not exactly the same. And that is if you have an empty planet in your system. You don't have a colony there, but nobody else does as, as well. So you're not having an encounter with any other player, but you can occupy that colony, and it's like a free encounter. What's well, not a free encounter, but you're not... 
going to be playing any cards. You just basically are going to go right from the destiny to resolution. You're going to put your ships, uh, however many you want from other colonies, well, up to four, and you're going to form a colony there. And that's your, that's your encounter. And if it's your first encounter, you get to have a second one. So it counts as a successful encounter. So it's not on here. It's not explicitly stated. Um, I, I've, I've taken a cue from Bill Martinson, and I've remade uh, my Destiny cards, not these. These are the official ones. Um, to include that third option just helps players know what their options are. And that's not one that's super clear in the rule book, but that is the procedure. That's what you get to do. If you have drawn your own color and there's an empty, there's a vacant planet in your system, uh, you could form that. You can get that colony. You don't have to go through any of the other phases. You're not playing any of those cards. You go straight to resolving that encounter by getting a colony there. Um, the next thing on the list has to do with new hands. It is not a super straightforward rule. Um, and that is because only two players in an encounter can draw new hands, and that's the offense and the defense, but they don't do it at the same time. Now, the rule book does, uh, at least one of the rule books anyway, does explain it in a, a pretty decent way, and it's, it, it's when you would need an encounter card, but even that can be a little bit misleading. Um, and so for the offense, in order to have an encounter at the start of your turn, you need to have an encounter card in your hand. And that's what they mean by that. You need to have an encounter card in order to proceed. So you would draw a new hand at the start of your turn, the start turn kind of phase. Uh, it's happening basically in regroup, but before you do anything that is a regroup action. So start turn is the first thing that happens. And you get a new hand as the offense. You draw, discard your non-encounter cards that you have, and you draw eight cards. And if you still don't have an encounter card, you just do that again until you, you do. Um, the way it, the reason it's misleading is, of course, if you get to uh, the second encounter and you don't have one, you say, well, I would need one, but you don't, you don't get to draw one then. You don't get to do it. And if you somehow, between start turn and the planning phase, you are deprived of any your last encounter card, well, your turn ends. So you would need one then too, but you don't really get one. Now for the defense, they don't actually need one until it's time to play one. So that's why they're drawing a new hand after the alliance phase. The alliance phase has ended. They've invited people. But um, if players are like, How, do you think you're going to win? And you're like, I don't know. I have no idea because I'm going to be drawing a new hand. Or if the offense is like, well, can we make a deal? You're like, Maybe if I draw a new hand and get a negotiate card, you don't know. Um, so some people, it, that bugs them that it's not just a, a straightforward rule, but I do actually prefer it this way. I like how it, it adds a little bit of intrigue to the proceedings. I like that the defense has to wait. They wait until it's time to play a card. And I know back way back in the day before that was very clear, we were as soon as I was you know declared the defense, I was drawing a new hand. Um, but I do prefer it this way, and, and this is why I include it on here. I want to make sure people get that right. The defense, they don't get to do it until after the alliance phase. When it is time for them to play an encounter card, they draw a new hand, and they, they too repeat that until they have drawn a hand that has at least one encounter card in it. So that is when you draw new hands. Uh, for the offense, start turn, and that's it. For the defense, it's at the end of the alliance phase, right at the beginning of the planning phase. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is uh, the ships in the encounter and and how that how that plays out uh, in terms of uh, let's say um, you've got the the offense they have their ships are going to be in the hyperspace gate pointed at the planet um, and their allies are going to be in the gate with them uh, the defense uh, if they have ships in the encounter they're they're on the the targeted planet. Uh, and anyone who is allied with the defense, it used to be that uh, the hyperspace gate was the hyperspace cone and had a little ring around it. And that was for where your defensive allies would go. They'd be on the ring to indicate they're in the encounter, but they're not going into the cone. They're not sucking down to the pointy end in order to land on the planet. Um, the gate's a little bit different. We've got a gate and the rule book says don't put your ships on the gate. They actually go 
sort of in between the gate and the planet. So they're not on the planet. Don't put your defensive ally, uh, allied ships on the targeted planet. They don't have a colony there. Uh, even if they do have a colony there, if they are allying, that they're not on that planet anymore. And so you can use your ships from the targeted planet if you are an ally there because your ships are not being attacked. Uh, you can take some of them. Don't take all of them off because then you don't have a colony there anymore. You can take some of them off to indicate that those are the ones that are in the encounter. And you can use ships from your other colonies as well, up to four. And then if your side wins, those ships can return to any of your colonies. They don't have to go back to where they came from. Uh, they could all go back onto the planet, again, if you have a colony there already. Um, so yeah, the other spaceships that are on the targeted planet, that, that are not the defenses, they're just bystanders. They're just watching. They are not involved. Even if that player is somehow involved in the encounter, those ships there are not targeted. So that is another thing that some people are not super clear on. They, they're, they've they set up lawn chairs on a hill. They are watching the battle. They are not at risk. They're not going to go to the warp if their side loses. Um, again, even if whether, unless they're the main player. Yeah, the main player, all of their ships on that targeted planet uh, are at risk and they're all involved. So that's an important thing for you to understand there. Um, the next thing I want to cover is deals. Um, a very common deal in the game is let's have a colony for colony exchange. Um, you say, yeah, great. Uh, I'll let you get a colony in my system. You let me get a colony in your system. That's typically how it works out. But it's important for you to understand that if you're making a deal with somebody, you can offer them a colony on any planet where you have a colony. It doesn't have to be your planet. So if you have a foreign colony, let's say that you're yellow and you have a foreign colony in green system and you're making a deal with red, you can give red a colony on that planet where you have a colony in green system. You can give them a, a colony there. So you're not limited to your own planets. Um, and maybe, you know, green doesn't want red there. Well, too bad. Um, they're not in the deal. So that is a perfectly legal way to do it. I should also mention, um, well, let's get into it. The, the next thing I want to talk about is is ships on, on the planets. Um, there's no limit. You start with four ships on each of your five planets, um, but you can have six ships on there, eight ships. You could have all 20 of your ships on one planet, and that is true of any, any colony. There's no limit to the number of ships you can have on a colony. Um, it's still only one colony, but... Um, People are like, oh, I can't put any more ships uh, on this planet. That is not true at all. It's not super clear in the rules. Uh, there is no ship limit to uh, how many ships you can put on a planet. What I will say is that you don't necessarily need to have a lot of ships on your foreign colonies. Uh, I would recommend you definitely have at least two. But sometimes somebody's like, oh, I'm attacking with four ships, and then they land there, and then they feel like those ships are stuck out there. Well, that's not true. You can, whenever you are adding ships to encounter, whether as an offensive uh, main player or as an ally for either side, the ships that you bring into the encounter can come from any of your colonies. And I would say, yeah, don't leave four ships out there. Now, there are certain effects that may be in the game, certain aliens where that uh, might not be true. But as a general rule, your foreign colonies are usually very safe. The main way that they can be attacked is if a player draws their own color and decides to attack you. But like I said, they're giving up their own opportunity to advance their score to do that. It's usually more in your interest to advance your score than it is to try to bump somebody else's score down. Um, so yeah, you don't feel like you have to leave four ships out there or, or have more. Again, unless there's an effect where that that is going to be important, and then you'll you'll know about it, but wouldn't worry about it uh, otherwise. Um, the next thing I want to talk about on this list, uh, and, and some of it has to do, not necessarily with the rule book, it just has to do with, um, sometimes it's just the previous editions of the game. The game's been around uh, for over 40 years. Uh, we like to say over 42 years. Um, and uh, it's gone through some minor changes over the years, and 
one of the things is the artifacts. Now, artifacts used to be called edicts, but two artifacts in particular, a lot of people get wrong in terms of when they can play them, and that is the plague and Mobius tubes. Now, in both cases, they have to be played in the regroup phase, which is the very beginning of an encounter. It's not the start turn, of course, it is, but it is the first phase of the encounter, regroup. That's when you have to play it. Um, so you don't get to plague somebody after, you, you know, they've drawn your color for destiny. You're like, oh, you're coming after me. I'm going to plague you so that you're weaker. You have to have already plagued them before you know that they're going to be attacking you. Um, usually it's easier when I'm playing, everybody just plagues me because they figure I'm probably going to win anyway. So I'm a good target, especially early in the game. Um, but I remember that and I, I take revenge, even if it takes years on anybody who plagues me just out of the blue willy nilly. So, um, don't really want to plague somebody who is an obvious threat. And again, maybe that is me, but, um, you know, you don't have to play it on the very first encounter of the game. You can wait a couple and, and see who's doing well and how the aliens are interacting, whatever. But regroup is when it happens. And with Mobius Tubes, not only does it have to be regroup, it has to be your regroup. You need to be the offense. And so I would say, again, especially if you are relatively new to Cosmic Encounter or haven't played it uh, a lot or very recently, or you have played a lot of the previous editions, um, a lot of the cards have little timing strips along the bottom uh, or somewhere on them that let you know the phase sometimes uh, or whether you need to be a main player or a specific kind of player like the offense. Just check those every once in a while. They're on there and um, they are right on almost all the cards. So very few mistakes there. Um, all right, let's get on to another specific one. This is kind of its own category, um, but it's Cosmic Zap. Uh, and there's always a question about, well, when can I play this Cosmic Zap? Can I Cosmic Zap somebody just as soon as I want to? And the answer is no, not really. Um, the way that Fantasy Flight has implemented Cosmic Zap and alien power use uh, specifically is with the word use or may use. It's on the alien sheet. And that is when you can Cosmic Zap a player's alien when that alien is being used. Now, the other big question is, what is the window of opportunity on there? And when is the statute of limitations? When is it now too late? And a, and a good question can be like, um, I wanna know if somebody is gonna take my card, <clears throat> um, can I cosmic zap them when, they're, when I know which card they're gonna take or do I have to wait? Uh, before we even know which player they're going to target with that effect. And what I will say is the design intent is that that window has some wiggle room. The original designers wanted effects like Cosmic Zap to not need to be uh, done so early uh, in, its, in its possible use that you don't really get to see what you're getting for your playing of the Cosmic Zap. Um, this is not one where I'm gonna be able to give you a super concrete, clear window. It is gonna to continue to be a little bit fuzzy, I'm afraid, but you you just wanna be like, all right, you um, are going to uh, have this effect. I know that I'm the target of the effect, or I know what cards, but before other information is revealed. So you wouldn't wanna have, be like, all right, you've, you've taken, you've traded my hand and as like the trader. The trader is like, I'm using my power to trade hands with you. And we've traded them and, you've, and you're like, oh, you know, uh, you've handed me your hand and I'm seeing that and no, I don't want it. So I'm gonna play Cosmic Zap. It's way too late for that. Um, for that window, it's like, all right, I'm gonna trade hands with you, you specifically. And you say, oh, you're targeting me. Um, and trader, of course, is, is, is going to be the opponent. So that's not much of a surprise. But you say, yeah, I'm cosmic zapping you. Or like, let's say hacker. Hacker gets to take their, their con compensation from anybody. So once they've said, yeah, I'm taking it from you, um, that's really when you want to cosmic zap them for that. But again, this is going to be the sort of thing where you're going to want to either just have like a house rule where maybe you... Um, if it's your house and your co copy of Cosmic, you can say, this is how we're implementing this. Um, or 
get some consensus on there. It may lead to uh, some big arguments, and certainly Cosmic Encounter is known to have that happen from time to time. Um, so I wish I could give you better guidance than that, but the idea is, like Chosen, you get to see them flip the cards, and then you could be like, sure, I'm going to Cosmic Zap you. And yes, you've gotten some information, but someone else hasn't revealed, you know, uh, part of their hand and stuff like that. I think that's that's crossing the line a little bit. Um, so you could be like, all right, which cards are you going to target? This one? No, I'm going to Cosmic Zap that. I would allow that, but... That's that's one that's probably worth having a greater discussion on. And if there were going to be a second edition of Cosmic Encounter, uh, this is one area where I would want to be uh, much clearer, if I could, uh, about that window of opportunity um, just to help players resolve these things for themselves. And there's, of course, other things. Certainly the start turn regroup thing is something we try to address a little bit uh, as well. Um, one other thing I will state about the cosmic zap and this comes up a lot and this one i feel like i can give a little bit of a better answer but people are like ah i want a cosmic zap your super flare can you cosmic zap a super flare and the answer is no you can't cosmic zap a flare it, it's very specific it zaps an alien if you want to zap a flare you need a card zap that's what a card zap is for but what i will say is that there is a little bit more to the story here some super flares, many of them in fact, open up the window of possibilities about when you can use your power. So let's say, for instance, I have a, an alien power that I can only use as a main player, but my super flare lets me use my power as an ally. So I play the, fl the flare and I say I'm using my power as, as an ally. Someone can cosmic zap that power. The flare is not zapped. But now the power is zapped, so the flare no longer has any effect. Its effect is now resolved, and that flare goes back into your hand. You've played a flare, and uh, you don't get to play another one, so you don't discard the flare. And that's the important distinction here, too, is that the cosmic zap only works on the, on the power. It doesn't work on the flare, um, so therefore the flare is unaffected. If you were to card zap a flare, the flare gets discarded. And so that's an important distinction. But not every alien uh, opens up. Some of these super flares uh, just give you a, a new thing that you can do. And, uh, and so if you're doing that new thing, should you be able to zap that? Well, only if it's a use. You can only use a cosmic zap if somebody is using their alien power. So some super effects are completely immune. Um make you immune to the cosmic zap. Not everything on an alien sheet can be zapped. And that's another important distinction. There are certain things that aliens just do, and those effects don't have use or may use as part of them, and they are not stopped. But if somebody doesn't have their alien power, that typically means they don't get to do the other stuff either. It's like they've lost their alien power if they were zapped using their power, and there's other things that they would get to do. That is not something they they will get to do without having that alien power. Um, I know there's some confusion about Warrior, and I'm just going to leave that as something that can be confusing because uh, that has nothing to do with me, and I don't really understand fully how that should work out, but there you have it. Um, so that's it. Those are all the things that I think you should you should definitely be... Well, there's certainly there's um, probably more, and if you have questions... Um, fire away and uh, and we'll, we'll get into it. I might do another video, but those are eight things that I found that a lot of people are constantly asking me about it. I get emails about it, people posting on the Future Pastimes Discord, on Board Game Geek. Um, in general, I don't, for me, I don't like to necessarily weigh in on controversy and weird rulings unless it's something that I designed because Part of my Cosmic Encounter mantra now at my age is that figuring stuff out for yourself in Cosmic Encounter is part of the game's charm, and your mileage will certainly vary. So I'm not, I'm certainly not saying, you know, send me every one of your Cosmic Encounter questions. There's so many on there, and in many cases, I would only be opining. I would be giving you my opinion. I can't give you a ruling on anything that I personally didn't design. I can try asking the original designers, but they, at this point, they're like, let the players figure it out. You know, we figured it out for a while, and even we didn't agree on uh, on all of those things. So um, 
and ask ask away. I'll give you my opinion, um, but don't feel like everything that I'm saying is a uh, golden rule that must be followed strictly. Or like, well, Jack Reed has said to here, and that's the end of it. Feel free to disagree, and also feel free to play it however however you want. Um, at the end of the day, it's your game, it's your experience. But if you're trying to play it as closely as rules as written as you can, then my advice in this video is to follow those steps uh, as much as you can. Um, there you have it. That's all I can really go into at this point. Thanks for watching. We'll see you again soon.